Well, we're back. I've got on a new pair of socks and I'm freshly shaved, so ready for more. Part two of Stress and Growth. Now, you'll remember the main point of the previous lecture, Amid Our Logic, Chronic Stress, Bad News for Growth, was the fact that environment does not begin at birth, that whole world of prenatal stress, that whole world of prenatal programming of adult metabolism, that was last lecture. What we'll emphasize here is growth not by way of signals from mom, but growth as experienced by the organism itself by way of stress. Okay, we know the logic once again, running away from the lion, blah, blah, chronic stress. How does this get turned into effects on growth? Because what you get after a while is precisely what seems logical, which is if you are a young organism and you are chronically stressed, you're not going to grow as fast. This is different from last lecture, chronic stress early in life, and when you're 70, things will be working differently. This is just a plain, straightforward world of lots of stress, and a kid doesn't grow as much. So what are some of the mechanisms underlying this? Some very straightforward ones, and ones that you could probably construct from lesson two, from the second lecture, going over the building blocks of the stress response, very simple those elevated levels of glucocorticoids, that elevated activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the decreased secretion of growth hormone, put those together and that's where you've got problems with growth. Another one as well, back, remember, the cardiovascular stress response. Not only do you want your blood pressure to go up to deliver energy to those thigh muscles, but in addition, you don't want to deliver blood to unessential areas like your gut. We saw in the previous lecture how one consequence of that is if you are chronically stressed and chronically decreasing blood flow to your gut, it's more prone towards an ulcer, that whole picture. What we see here is if you were a kid and you were chronically decreasing blood flow to your gut, you're not absorbing nutrients as readily. So that's another mechanism by which you can disturb growth in kids thanks to chronic stress. Now, another question that seems to come up here over and over as we look at some of these adverse outcomes, how big of effects are these? Ooh, thanks to enormous amounts of childhood stress, you're one-eighth of an inch shorter than you would have been otherwise. No, these are not small, subtle effects. And at an extreme, you get one of the truly bizarre, disturbing outposts of medicine, a disease of kids who are so stressed that they stop growing entirely termed stress dwarfism, also known as psychosocial dwarfism, psychogenic dwarfism, and this is for real. This is a child where there's no obvious disease, there's no malnutrition, there's no parasites. You look in the bloodstream and there's no growth hormone. You give them synthetic growth hormone, nothing happens, the whole system is shut down. And what you have here are the consequences of truly sustained adverse stress. You check around with that kid's background and out comes some appalling psychological stressor. And this is standard textbook knowledge. Get some textbook of endocrinology, look in the chapter on growth, and I guarantee you somewhere in there will be the obligatory picture of the stressed dwarfism kid. You know those pictures, this is, you know, the stunted kid who's naked in front of the growth chart with a rectangle over the eyes, and then I guarantee you turn the page and you see the consequence of removing that child from that stressful setting. Technical term, you do a parentectomy on them, get them into a different setting, you turn that page, and there's the same kid two years later, and they're like six foot fourteen, and they're playing for the NBA, and you know, they're still naked with the rectangle, but everything else gets better. What we see here is the profound capacity of stress to disrupt growth and the remarkable capacity to recover from it. One dramatic example, and this was a paper that was published a few years ago about a child with stress dwarfism who wound up in New York Hospital, a child from a severely stressful psychological setting, and they showed when the child came into this pediatric ward, growth hormone levels were like at the floor. 
Over the next three months, he developed this close relationship with this one nurse. This was like the first normal emotional relationship of his life. By the end of those three months, he had perfectly normal levels of growth hormone. At that point, nurse goes on vacation. By the end of the two-week vacation, the boy's back down to virtually zero. Nurse comes back from vacation, bounces back up. Think about it. Think about it. The rate at which this child was depositing calcium in his bones could be predicted by just how loved and safe he was feeling in the world. You can't ask for a much better example of what's going on here affects every outpost in the body. So we have stress dwarfism. The question then becomes one of magnitude, one of frequency. How common is this disease? If you are shorter than average and you were not obviously malnourished as a kid, are you a victim of stress dwarfism? That's something else your parents did to you? No, this is not conventional stress. This is not, ooh, when I was a kid, we moved all the time, very stressful. This is not acrimonious divorce. This is nightmare psychopathology. This is the police and the social workers breaking down the door of the apartment and finding the child chained to the radiator, smeared in excrement, total nightmare stuff, and remarkably get the child out of that setting and there is recovery. And the general consensus in the field is this is a remarkably rare disease. This is a once in a career disease to see, extremely rare. Except it's not so rare. It pops up all over the place. It pops up in areas of, perfectly logically, extreme stress. For example, a whole literature emerging about these poor kids who were raised in the Romanian orphanages shortly after the fall of communism there. And this was just the nightmare settings of kids like warehoused in these orphanages with incredible absence of stimulation and contact and affection, all of that major, major impairment of growth. Okay, so that's one disturbing realm. But it pops up in other places as well. Here's a great historical factoid. King Frederick II of Sicily, some 13th century despot, who clearly was you know, an early pioneering endocrinologist. I don't know what was going on in their court, but one day they were sitting around there having this argument about what's the natural language of humans. Presumably there was no villages to pillage and loot or whatever. So they were doing philosophy instead that winter. And what's the natural language? And they were holding out one for Greek and another for Latin or classical Hebrew. And presumably Frederick II of Sicily was holding out for Italian. And he did what was for the time a remarkable experiment. He got some children. He commandeered some children in his kingdom and he had them raised in complete isolation for a number of years. Isolation like no one talking to them. Like whoever's giving them food runs in silently and leaves food for them. Minimal contact with other humans. And the notion in this experiment was at some point they're going to open the door and out will come the child reciting in classical Greek or whatever it is the natural language of humans. And eventually they opened the door and the kids did not come out speaking classical Greek. The kids did not come out at all. They had died from the extreme of stress dwarfism. So more examples of that, more examples where this comes up. Amid this picture of, oh, this is only at the great extremes, what you've got instead is a lot of cases where it does occur. One example, kids who grow up in areas, war zones, areas of civil strife, kids who grow up with all sorts of family dynamics that are highly stressful. Here's one really interesting example. This was a classic study done by a pair of anthropologists in the early 60s looking at kids from different cultures and asking how physically stressful are the rites of passages in this culture. Rites of passages, you know, in some culture they scarification or piercing of body parts or tattooing or putting you out in the desert with poison answer. And in some cultures, you know, you have to play the piano for your grandmother and her friends. What Whatever's done in your particular tribe, they did like 80 comparisons, they controlled for genetics, they did this perfectly, and what they showed was highly physically stressful rites of passages between ages 6 to 15 or so, one and a half inches shorter as an adult. 
Let me tell you about the single creepiest example of stress dwarfism I've ever heard of. And if this doesn't unnerve you, you've got like no imagination at all. Here it is. If for some inexcusable reason you find yourself reading chapter after chapter about growth hormone, you're going to find this weird pattern, which is a lot of these chapters make reference to Peter Pan. Peter Pan like... Oh, I don't know, Peter Pan, quotes from Peter Pan, snide comments about Tinkerbell. I'd seen this for years, and I had no idea what was going on. Until one day, I'm reading a chapter about stress regulation and growth and the possibilities for stress dwarfism, gave the following case history, which is eight-year-old boy growing up in Victorian England perfectly comfortable middle-class family in the 1870s. One day, he sees his beloved older brother killed in front of him in an accident. This destroys the family. There were no other children. The father was like emotionally non-existent. This was the mother's favorite child in this Victorian swoon. She takes to her bed with the shades drawn for the next 10 years or so. Here's this child growing up in this complete emotional vacuum. And there's these terrible scenes where like he brings in a tray of food for his mother and she's saying, oh, David, David, is that you, David? If you come to me, de David, the dead son. And she'll go on, oh, David, are you finally, oh, it's only you. Growing up being only you. Apparently, one of the only things that the mother ever talked to him about was this crazy idea that she grabbed onto, which was, if David had to die, he died when he was still my perfect little boy. He never grew up into a man who doesn't need his mother anymore. He'll always be my perfect little boy. He didn't grow up, didn't grow up, didn't grow up. This kid hears this with a vengeance. No evidence of malnutrition, no evidence of disease, stops growing at that point. Lives to 60 years of age, under five feet tall, dramatic effect, unconsummated marriage. And this winds up being a wild example of stress dwarfism. And then the chapter concludes by informing us that as an adult, this was the author of the much beloved children's classic, Peter Pan. This was J.M. Barry, the author of Peter Pan. This was one incredibly messed up guy. This was a guy who just cranked out plays after novellas after about boys who die and come back as ghosts and marry their mothers and all sorts of stuff like that. His private journals were full of sadomasochistic fantasies with little boys. This guy spent the rest of his life not very effectively dealing with his stress dwarfism. So you may want to think about that the next time you see Johnny Depp up on the screen. But that's a case of one. That's a sample of one. What's the experimental evidence? Another remarkable, remarkable example, a textbook example, where if you were working with lab rats, you could not have designed a better experiment. And this was in an orphanage in Germany shortly after World War II. A series of orphanages, in fact. And what was noted was the children in one of these orphanages had a very stunted growth rate compared to the other ones. And people went and studied, and what they thought might have been relevant was the woman running the orphanage, who was this cold, berating woman who had like zero physical contact with the kids. Okay, that's a nice speculation. Now what was done was the sort of thing that you could not have done any better with the rats, the woman was transferred to a different orphanage. And suddenly, the growth rates in that orphanage went down. Remember, everything's controlled for the kids in all these orphanages are getting the same diet, the same number of doctor's visits, the same vaccinations. All that was different was this woman in charge. One additional wrinkle, which was, and she moved her favorites with her to each orphanage she was assigned to, and those favorites grew at a normal rate. This is a classic example, another one of those that winds up in every textbook. So based on this, suddenly there's all sorts of possible therapies that come to mind. And a remarkable one was worked out a few decades ago by a psychologist at the University of Miami named Tiffany Field. And what she did was notice one of the high points, one of the triumphs of modern medicine with a very major downside, which is you look at kids who wind up in NICUs, neonatal intensive care units, and they are taken care of in tubes and tests and monitors and all sorts of things. And in the process of that, there's one thing they don't have, which is a whole lot of physical contact with people. 
And Field came up with this idea, how about we go in and physically stimulate these preemies, these severe preemies, how about we go in and massage their backs? Massage their backs. How do you massage the back of a tiny preemie? You're doing it with your thumbs. And they went in and they did it three times a day and they discovered something remarkable, which was there was about a 50% increase in the growth rate in the preemies who were stimulated in this way. The babies were more alert. They were more active, they went home at an earlier stage. And looking at them months later, their growth rates were still enhanced. This was a remarkable effect. And Field and the sort of people who have followed up on her work have done some estimates that if this were done in every neonatal ward in the country, it would save a huge number of lives. It would save billions of dollars in terms of the long-term adverse consequences of being an extreme preemie. A remarkable demonstration that get just the right amount of stimulation and growth is enhanced just as we've been seeing get the wrong amounts into the stressful range and you disrupt normal growth. Now all of this is about kids, but somewhere in there we've got to think about uh, adults because by now I've noted growth hormone. Growth hormone has popped up a whole bunch of times in this course so far and growth hormone used to create less of it during stress, all of that. What does growth hormone do? It makes you grow, which is what kids are about. But you look at adults, and they've got plenty of growth hormone in their bloodstream. And most of us as adults, we're not growing anymore other than wider as the years go by. What's growth hormone doing in the adult? And it turns out a very special role that at first was thought to have nothing to do with stress, but where the jury might be no longer out on this, which is what you do with growth hormone is remodel your bones. Now, most of us view bones as totally boring and nothing's happening there and they just kind of keep your body together and bipedal and stuff like that. Bones are extremely dynamic parts of the body. You're putting in calcium, you're taking it out, you're remodeling. I mean, how else does somebody get bow-legged if you're not constantly remodeling your bones in response to the world around it? So what's doing the remodeling? You pull calcium out, you put it in. Growth hormone plays a huge role in depositing new calcium into bones. So along comes chronic stress, and it's not that you're a kid impairing growth. You're an adult. Growth hormone levels drop, and what might be the consequence of that? You are now depositing less calcium into your bones. So what's that going to set you up for? Brittle bones, prematurely aged bones, osteoporosis, and suddenly in the realm of stress-related disease, there's this possibility that chronic stress can increase the risk of osteoporosis. Now, what the consensus was in the field until some time ago was, yes, 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 this is possible, but this is not likely to occur. You need such extremes of adult stress and such a collapse in growth hormone secretion that you never actually get over an osteoporosis. You may get the first little baby steps in that direction, but nonetheless, this is not a realm of stress-related diseases you need to worry about. And some years ago, it became clear that this wasn't the case. And this was work done by Carol Shively and Jay Kaplan at Bowman Gray Medical School. And they showed that there was a tragic, confused flaw in the whole biomedical literature built around doing this. And the flaw was as follows. The tendency of scientists to study male rats and male monkeys and male college students and they're not all that representative of what animals are about, what humans are about, because it's losing half of the equation. Overwhelming, the literature was built around studies of males. Now, what happens when you're male and you're chronically stressed? As we know by now, up go glucocorticoid levels, down go growth hormone levels. And what does that wind up doing? Up increased glucocorticoid levels, you're pulling a lot of calcium out of your bones, low growth hormone levels, you're not replacing it, and as we've seen, put those pieces together in the male, rats, monkeys, etc., and you get just a hint of osteoporosis. Chronically stressed females, and something else happens. 
You've got the elevated, the glucocorticoid levels. You have the suppressed growth hormone levels. But as we are going to find out in the next lecture, something else gets suppressed, which are levels of estrogen. Now, amid all the controversies of hormone replacement therapy with estrogen postmenopausally, one thing that is absolutely clear is estrogen is very good for the health of your bones. Estrogen promotes calcium uptake. Estrogen is terrific in that guard. It decreases your risk of osteoporosis. That's great. So with females with chronic stress, instead of two things going wrong that puts you within the ballpark of osteoporosis, three things, elevated glucorticoids, low growth hormone, and low estrogen, and suddenly you're more at risk for osteoporosis. At this point, the work of Shively and Kaplan have shown that this is precisely what's going on in lab monkeys and experimental monkeys, females with chronic stress, manipulating estrogen levels. Not quite clear in humans yet. The work is still going on in that area. Okay, so we've had this whole range of possible ways in which things can go wrong, prenatal stress, postnatal stress, effects on growth, how long-term are they, how common are these disorders of blunted growth in response to stress, what can be done about it perhaps, the field, Tiffany Field studies of intervention with extreme preemie kids. Lurking around in all of this here is the same sort of theme that was lurking around in the previous lecture, which is parenting style. And how does parenting style wind up influencing the growth rate. And for this, one has to get a sense of history and the history of what sort of parents parents have been advised to be. And for a gazillion generations, all of us grew up under the advice of Spock, Dr. Spock. Back around 1900, there was a different person who was the expert, a man named Luther Holt at Columbia University. And Holt was the most influential expert at the time teaching parents about parenting. And what he had to say was very different from a Dr. Spock scenario. He was the person of the school of spare the rod, spoil the child, children are meant to be seen and not heard. He even used phrases like referring to the vicious practice of picking up babies when they were crying and advising parents not to do that. This was an extremely stern view of what parenting should be. This was the dominant model at the time. And a number of decades later, with this remaining as the dominant model, along came a man who absolutely revolutionized this field, a man named Harry Harlow. Now, to appreciate what Harlow accomplished, you have to consider what were some of the dominant schools of psychology at the time. In addition to this whole view of people like Holt, of very stern, detached parenting styles, there was this school of psychology that dominated American psychology in the 20th century, the field of behaviorism. Best personified by the most famous behaviorist of all time, B.F. Skinner of Harvard, and in a totally simplified way, what was behaviorism about? You get rewarded for something, you're more likely to do it later. You get punished for something, you're less likely to do it. Positive, negative reinforcement, those are not exactly comparable to reward and punishment. Nonetheless, this general world of behaviorism, things that have good outcomes, you're more likely to do afterward. Things with bad outcomes, less. So what would behaviorists have to say about this whole maturational process amid Luther Holt type advice? Somewhere up there comes this question, why do kids wind up getting attached to their mothers? Why do kids bond to their mothers? And you're a behaviorist, and you had the exact answer, which is you get attached to mom because she feeds you. You get positively reinforced. You get reinforced in those circumstances where you're sitting there saying, my gosh, I'm feeling a little bit hypoglycemic, and here's this breast belonging to mom, and soon I'm not so hypoglycemic. Why? I'll begin to have all sorts of positive feelings about this individual. That was the behaviorist view. Why do we get attached to mothers? Because mothers supply this essential need for nutrients. That was the dominant thinking at the time. And all you have to do is combine that with the sort of thinking in the Holt school of parenting style, and you come up with some pretty stern views, which is basically, as long as you provide a kid with food and adequate warmth and things like that, that's all you need to do. 
And remarkably, this dominated pediatrics at the time, hospital policies, pediatric boards, something that is inconceivable these days, which is your child winds up with some illness and is in a pediatric ward for a few weeks or so. And what was the rule at the time in most of these hospitals? Parents were allowed in for a few minutes a day. Perhaps parents were allowed in only for an hour a week because after all, all parents do is mess up the process with the vicious practice of picking up their kids and coddling them. And what we've learned from Skinner and learned from the likes of Luther Holt is supply food, supply the right number of blankets, and that's all you need to do to be doing things correctly. So here comes the Harlow Revolution. Here's where this critical experiment was done that transformed how people think about the subject. One that winds up in every single textbook. I can almost guarantee you've seen one of the pictures from this experiment if you've ever taken Psych 101. This was this classic, brilliant experiment that Harlow did. He takes baby monkeys. Baby monkeys being raised without a mother, a biological mother. And what they're raised with instead are two different types of surrogate mothers. Substitute mothers for a real monkey mother. First one, the first one was a tube of chicken wire with some styrofoam monkey head looking thing up on top and a bottle of milk sticking out of the chicken wire torso, roughly where the breasts are. Second mother. Second surrogate, a tube of chicken wire with a monkey head on top and no milk, instead a warm terry cloth wrapped around the torso. So you ask the question, which of these two surrogate mothers is a baby monkey going to get attached to? And if you're B.F. Skinner, it's completely obvious what the answer is, and you would expect Skinner to very quickly be clutching the, the chicken wire mom with the baby bottle there because that one supplies nutrients. And of course, you get attached to mom because she supplies you with nutrients. Look at a real living primate. Look at these baby monkeys, and they did something very different instead which is, sure, they were willing to go on the chicken wire mothers with milk. They needed milk. Who were they attached to, though? Who did they spend most of their time on? Who, when something scared them, did they go scampering to for comfort? The warm mother with the terry cloth. It's not that you get attached to mom because she gives you an adequate number of calories. You get attached to mom because she makes you feel safe and makes you feel beloved, and what Harlow did was introduce a word into the technical scientific literature in his papers, the word love. You get attached to mom because she supplies things that are oh so much more important and fundamental and interesting than adequate calories and you know keeping your body at the same temperature that it's supposed to be. And out of Harlow's work came enormously important elaborations. One, a study, for example, that showed just how wrong the behaviorists were. Here, you've got the cloth mom, which a baby monkey is happy to hold on to. And what you've got is, in the middle of the torso, was a little spigot that could blast out, very briefly, a jet of air. Unpleasant. And not something you would want to stick around for if you're a behaviorist. And the rule that was set up was when you clutch onto the torso of the mom, you get a blast of air coming out of the torso. Any behaviorist would have predicted at that point that what the baby monkeys are supposed to do is they stop clinging. And what they did instead makes perfect sense to anyone who has grown up and attached to anyone. The more they got blasted with the air, the harder they held on to mom. There's no positive, negative reinforcement world there of, oh, you get unattached individuals blast you with jets of air. What we have here is remarkable insight into things like, why do we love people who mistreat us? Why do we make the wrong choices in that realm? And it's got to do with what it is we attach to. And what Harlow showed was, it's not about calories, it's about comfort and safety and love. Now, Harry Harlow's work has wound up being enormously controversial. And this was a man who has been just...